Oh, okay. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Louise Kenwood, and I'm running the Moving Mountains Project, which is a new project that for the first time brings nature writing together with people who live with chronic illness and physical disability. It explores the relationship to the more than human world from the perspective of those of us who cannot ignore the bodies that we live in, um, those of us who do not move through the world unhindered by our physical form, and for whom climbing mountains and trekking through rough terrain is often out of reach. Moving mountains is therefore not about overcoming or conquering, but of living with and connecting. And while we're collating an anthology of 22 writers and artists, we're also running this series of workshops. And it's with thanks to Arts Council England funding and everybody who plays the lottery that enables us to run these events for free. And I'm especially pleased to be bringing this session to you today during Disability Pride Month and in the week of events that Society of Authors Group, Authors with Disabilities and Chronic Illnesses is running. And they've had a series of fantastic events this week, which also were all recorded and you can find on the Society of Authors uh, website. Do put in the chat where you're joining us from. This session is being recorded and the link will be posted on the Moving Mountains website where you can also catch up with other sessions if you miss them. So just before we get to the writing, one of the things I've really wanted to do as part of this project is to raise awareness and understanding of some of the conditions that impact on many of our lives, but that are often poorly understood and can be difficult to get diagnosed. And one of the groups that we've been fortunate to link with is HMSA, the Hypermobility Syndromes Association. And I'm really pleased that Lisa Bone, their CEO, is joining us today. Now, after years of working in the corporate sector, Lisa moved to the charity world around 12 years ago and has helped to support, grow and develop a range of smaller charities. After living in London for many years, Lisa now lives in rural Staffordshire, surrounded on all sides by fields and sheep, which sounds amazing. So he's very aware of the benefits and importance of nature and its changing vistas. Lisa joined the HMSA in January this year as part-time CEO. She also works for another charity and is trustee of another local charity supporting young people and a small grant giving charitable trust. Louise has joined us today to share some of the work that she and HMSA are doing and why it's so important. So I'd like to offer a very warm welcome to Lisa. Over to you. Thank you and thank you so much um, for inviting me here today. It's really great, such an exciting project and um, I know that sort of interacting with with nature whether it's through a window whether it's gardening whether it's growing things on, on window cells in all sorts of different ways is, is really important for our members so thank you very much I've got a quick few slides I promise it won't be um death by powerpoint so let me just try and share those just one second is that working can everyone see that? Great. So um, as Louise said, I joined the HMSA back in January um, and I just wanted to, to thank you today for giving me the opportunity to just tell you a little bit more about our uh, community of support. As Louise says, it's one of those um, areas which, like many chronic illnesses, is often missed, undiagnosed or, you know, just kind of under the radar. So the, the HMSA is here to support everyone with symptomatic hypermobility, whatever the cause, however mildly or severe, and whether they're um, diagnosed or not. And what we find, um, because um, hypermobility, like so many chronic illnesses, has different symptoms with different people, they can overlap with other things, but when people first come to the HMSA, it's almost like they're saying, oh, you've helped me join the dots. There've been things going on for years, which I hadn't really understood, but now you've helped me to um, sort of link it all together. So what we try and do is provide all sorts of different types of support. And I won't try and go through everything today because it'll be the, the tip of the iceberg. But in terms of, we run things like local groups, we have a membership scheme, which gives even more information and support. We have um, additional resources. We run a wide range of um, patient sessions from things like um, physio and pilates, relaxation sessions, ask the occupational therapist, um, nutrition, a wide range of things. And it's really about all of our help, all of our support is about helping people to 
in large, you know, maybe get towards diagnosis, but also help them to self-manage so that they can sort of live, uh, you know, more easily from day to day and, and improve their well-being. So we also have a helpline, we have online local Facebook support, we get lots of queries through our social media, all sorts of different things. And we also um, work to support professionals so they're more likely to spot the signs of hypermobility and know how to respond accordingly uh, with diagnosis and so we also provide professional education so a wide range of things but there's a lot more information on our website so I won't I won't go through everything now hold on my slides I'm not moving oh there we go so I think one of the things that I um, really struck me when I joined uh, the HMSA it's just that it's really here for everyone. We like to think that we cover the full range of um, hypermobility and, and for people who are sort of less aware of hypermobility, hypermobility is quite common. So about one in 10 people might have hypermobility, often without significant issues. So it might be someone um, like me who um, was terrible at sports at school, but somehow always made it into the gymnastics club because I was really flexibility or terrible at sport, but surprisingly good in a yoga class, despite the fact that the, the yoga teacher would keep telling me just to watch my arms and not overextend. So I think there is an argument about a broader awareness actually, because some of the people who uh, are not marginalized in more serious conditions, but some of the people who have the mild, milder symptoms when they're young, a bit like me, who's not as young as she once was, get creakier and realize the things they could have done sooner but I think it does hypermobility covers a massive range from really um, severely affected people to to the milder the milder level so hypermobility kind of can co come about by various different ways there's um, the inherited disorders like Marfan's there's things like Ellis Danlos the Stickler syndrome um, there are specific charities for those conditions and we absolutely work with them and um, some people are members of our organization and those organizations um, but we also try and include the people with maybe who've just got looser ligaments joint shape and uh, maybe can you know hypermobility because it's a, a side effect of another condition like down syndrome or cerebral palsy or people who've um developed hypermobility later in life either because of a result as a kind of knock-on effect of another condition or because of repeated injury, strain, etc. So you might get that in yoga enthusiasts or, or gymnasts, those kinds of things. So I think the thing that I think is really important is that there's room for everyone under our Bendy umbrella and it's all about inclusivity um, in, our, in our organization. So we're very much here to provide support for hypermobile people and the um, professionals. And I think one of the things, and I don't know whether um, Polly and Louise have found this over the years, is, is actually recognition, validation. Actually, you're not imagining it. There are things going on and that actually there's some things that can be, can be done. I don't know about your personal experiences there. Um, yeah, definitely me, Lisa. And I'm, I think f for me who um, have, got a lot from from your bendy umbrella of support in terms of research and, and making sense like you say of these weird and wonderful symptoms that seem completely unconnected and when you go to the doctor they are interested in kind of one thing at a time um, and so it's quite difficult to make sense of something that seems to be a constantly moving beast and the typical symptoms of pain and fatigue certainly that affected me it come up oh, time and time again and it's hard to find to kind of trace back to the um to, to sort of one of the one of the root causes anyway so so yeah to know that you're you're there and to have that connection with other people has been really important for me in, in trying to understand it definitely and I think that's the thing isn't it because there are so many there's a, such a broad range of symptoms from the kind of joint instability and fatigue the crossover with things like POTS and autonomic dysfunction, you know, sometimes it's gastric disturbances of, you know, a really big range of symptoms that affect people in, in different ways and also at different times in their, their life. And I think whilst we absolutely have our medical advisory group and we've got some fantastic experts, I think the thing that's really blown me away um, 
since I've joined is just the quality of the volunteers that we've got, most of whom are hypermobile. And so we've got people who do a whole range of things from, you know, social media and bookkeeping all the way through to, you know, uh, relaxation and hypnotherapists, specialists, physios, OTs, nutritionalists. You know, so some people are just doing a bit of, fun, you know, fundraising, which is really important for a small organisation like us, but a wide range of things. But I think because so many of our volunteers have lived experience, it goes, you know, the practical advice and the, the empathy that they can bring and the, that real understanding goes so much further than you can get from just sort of theoretical understanding of research or clinical understanding. So I think that's really what um, brings it alive. And you can see from our, you know, our Facebook page that there's a constant string of inquiries from around the world. And we, you know, whether you're a member or not, we'll try and, and try and give you advice on that. So I think it, a lot of what we do is about self-management, about practical advice um, and about, you know, pacing. And so, you know, and it's because of our volunteers, we, we try and uphold that with our volunteers as well, that we're really able to do everything that we do. So as I sort of just said, we do do a huge amount. We're a very, very small charity, actually. There's literally two paid members of staff, me and one other, which don't make up one full-time member of staff. And we do a huge amount, but we do also have, I think our volunteers also form a community of support themselves. So if anybody is interested in becoming a volunteer, even if it's just for a few hours a week, then we're always, um, you know, very welcome. There's more information about that on our website. And I have to say this because we're a charity and we are very small, support with fundraising and or donations is always desperately needed. Really the amount that we, we kind of punch above our weight due to the volunteers, but that doesn't need, mean that we don't still need, need the funding. But it is a really warm, welcoming community and we're really supportive of volunteers. So, you know, if it's, for example, it's really hot today and some, you know, it's just not a day for volunteering, that's fine. We understand that, we get that. So, uh, you know, we're very, very flexible. So I know that people didn't come here to listen to me. So there's loads more information on our website. Um, we'd really love it if you uh, want to find out more, if you want to sign up as a member, um, the individual membership rates, we try and keep them as low as possible at 24 pounds a year, but they do cover a lot of resources, a lot of patient events, the journal, et cetera. So you, it's, it's good value for money. Um, but do have a look at our website to find out more. Even if you don't want to sign up and you have uh, personal issues with hypermobility, friends, family members, do point them in our direction. And if you just want to kind of get a bit more of a feel for our organization and our ethos, do follow our social media feeds. We're on Facebook, Insta, and Twitter. Um, really active on Facebook. So, so have a look. And um, we're absolutely here for you if you need us. Thank you so much. But I'll, I think everyone really wants to hear from Polly. So I will uh, stop now. Well, just before you go, Lisa, one of the things that, that really means a lot to me as, as a patient that, that lives with this, that's found it really hard to get diagnose is how we work with professionals as well so it's it's kind of a huge scope that you that you run there's also a really good question that's come up um before you go that you might be able yeah. to answer is hypermobility similar to fibromyalgia is there anything you want to say about that i think the best person the my team of volunteers will probably answer that question better than me uh, there's certainly some some overlaps but I think if they do want a specific answer on that which is more informed than the one I'm going to give then if they just contact us via our website or via our um, Facebook inbox then someone will give them a better answer than I will and this is what I mean in terms of the, the real knowledge comes from those people who've got more um, more lived experience so I'm kind of on the very mild end of the spectrum <laughs> But there's also there's lots of interesting Venn diagrams of these different yeah. conditions overlapping, isn't there? I'll I'll look up the website. Also, O Twist is a good one for looking at those kind of um, different conditions that overlap. Um, uh, and I think that's true. And I think that's one of the issues with diagnosis, isn't it? Is that there's so much overlap between different interlinking things that it can make it um, really diff difficult to sort of pin down but yeah there, there, there is often overlap with other 
uh, the conditions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was really, really helpful to put so much information together in, in such a short time um, and to point people in directions of, of um, more information, I think, is, is really useful. So I'll try and find those links and pop it in the chat while um, after I've introduced Polly. Um, but moving on to the writing session, um, I'm thrilled to present Polly Atkin. She's one of our contributing authors to the anthology, and I'm really pleased to have her with us today. So Polly is a poet and nonfiction writer, and live, it comes, with a, comes to us from the English Lake District. Her first poetry collection, Basic Nest Architecture, published by Seren, is followed by Much With Body, also published with Seren last year, and is a PBS Winter 2021 recommendation. And both beautiful collections. Her biography, Recovering Dorothy, The Hidden Life of Dorothy Wordsworth, published by Sarah Band, is the first to focus on Dorothy's later life and illness. And Polly is currently working on a memoir of essays exploring place, belonging and disability. Her work often reflects on her experiences of living with genetic hemochromatosis and hypermobile Ellis Daniels syndrome. Over to you, Polly. Thanks so much, Louise. And uh, thank you, Lisa, as, as well, um, for that. It's so fantastic. Um, all the support that HMSA gives, I think, is, is so useful because it does cover um, so many different conditions. You know, that, that big welcoming umbrella um, is incredibly useful to us all. Um, so we're going to do some writing. Um, we've got a big group today, but not too big. Um, so hopefully we can keep it a little bit interactive as we go as well. Um, we have a little over an hour for the workshop um, and we'll take a, a little break um, about 10 to 7 as well depending on how we're going so you can just have a, a, a bit of a break as well um, but also as I set the exercises and we go um, you know you can um, walk away if you need to walk away and come back again do whatever you need to do to feel comfortable as we go. I've popped a link in the chat to the bits of reading that I'll share as we go through um, and I will put exercises in the chat too um, and then afterwards I can send you the entire um, transcript of this too. Um, so you have everything there. Um, so if you've heard me talk about nature writing before, you might know some of my feelings um, about um, what's traditional in nature writing versus what I'd like to see more of, uh, which is a lot of what the Moving Mountains project is, is doing, um, which is just a really wonderful thing. Um, nature writing is often focused on this experience of striding out into a wild landscape. Um, revolving around the figure that Kathleen Jamie called the lone and raptured male, um, who, as people often forget, she also said, is necessarily bright, healthy, and highly educated. And I think that healthy is really important to enable them to boldly go into the landscape without thinking about restrictions or responsibilities. Um, there's a great academic essay collection, Disability Studies and the Environmental Humanities Towards an eco crip Theory, um, edited by Sarah Jaquette Ray and Jay Sibara. And they call this figure the wilderness body ideal um, in that book. And I think about that a lot, what the wilderness body ideal is. And in one of the essays, they talk about the fact that the wilderness body ideal sees disability only as a threat um, to that ideal. So there's really no place for the disabled body within that kind of discourse. So this workshop, as you might hope, takes a bit of a different approach to writing about nature and the landscape, thinking about how and where we meet nature if we cannot access wild spaces or if our access to wild spaces comes at a cost to our body minds. We're going to explore some ways in which you experience nature in your daily life. For me right now, it's jackdaws in the garden who I can hear squawking all the way through um, this. They're being very, very loud right now. Um, but it might mean looking in pavement cracks or ceiling corners, out the window, on your doorstep, 
in houseplants or pets, or even within your own body. Nature doesn't have to be something we go out to find elsewhere. We'll also think about the role of imagination, memory, and research, of traveling in the mind or through other media, say TV, the internet, or reading, if we can't travel in our bodies. And because I think we could probably all use a bit of it right now, we're going to focus on how the natural world can help us access moments of joy, solace, comfort and peace, um, which is not in any way the same as the idea of the nature cure, which I have some very salty feelings about that I won't go into right now. So for startups, we're going to do a warm up. Um, and I'd like you just to make a list without thinking, um, just the first things that come into your mind um, when I ask you when, where, and how you experience nature. So what is nature to you? Um, where do you experience it? What does it mean to you? I'll pop that in the chat. So once you've got a bit of a list coming up, I'd like you to pick one instance of where you access or meet um, or experience nature and just describe it again without thinking too much, just anything that comes to mind, um, any kind of feelings that come to mind as well as you go. And I'll just give you a couple of minutes to write that down. Always from the gross reality towards the subtle, subtle, subtle. Okay, so hopefully you're starting to get a bit of a, a build up there. Did anything particular come up for anybody when they were thinking about that? Either something in the chat. Yeah, go on. I was just wondering whether my dog, I, I was writing about my dog, but I was just wondering whether he could be classed as like nature. Yeah. We automatically think of what's outside. But like I, I've got my dog curled up next to me, fast asleep, and to me, that that's nature. Yeah, completely. Um, I, I think as you say, we think of nature often as something that's outside. We don't think about our relationships with non-human things around us, which might be domesticated. So, so our pets, but our pets are part yeah. of nature too, in the same way as we are. I think that that's lovely. Um, thinking about your dog. Um, anyone else thinking about a pet or, or something like that? Okay. Not so much a pet, but um, there's a lot of nature in the garden and the relationship um, that I have with the, the animals and um, the sort of give and take that there is in that. 
Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, whether we think of the garden as a wild space or a not wild space. And I think one of the things that I'm really interested in in expansions of nature writing is to think about the natural stuff that is really close to us in that way. So things that we can find in our gardens or um, on our windowsills um, that don't have to be um, wild, um, whatever that may, might mean, um, and kind of reclaiming that. I think it's really interesting, though, as well. Whenever I'm thinking about that now, I can't stop thinking about um, an article about green prescribing um, that I read a couple of years ago um, that kind of suggested that gardens were not an adequately wild space for us to, to have a reaction to. And I thought, wow, OK, that, that's really interesting. They've clearly um, not seen how wild our garden is. <laughs> well, yes, yes. Mine too. <laughs> um, gardening not being a very disability friendly sport sometimes. Um, <laughs> I think uh, my garden definitely does what it wants to do. Um, but uh, I think for a lot of us, that that's our experience of, of nature as well, isn't it? It's kind of slightly domesticated nature. Um, but then there's a different argument to be had about how far any of the, the things out there, especially in the UK, um, are ever anything but kind of domesticated or slightly feral um, at best. Um, what is this idea of wild um, that we think we're going out to get? And yes, Charlotte said in the chat, um, love my garden and birds, insects, plants, really helps me focus my mind away from my body. Um, and I think that's really important. And that's something we're going to think about next. Um, so something that I kept coming back to in the early stages of the pandemic um, was a poem by um, Tunisian American poet Leila Chatti called T. Um, and very helpfully for us, um, it was published in Missouri Review. And so you can read it online. And there's also a little interview um, with her about it there. Um, so her collection, Deluge, focuses or kind of reflects on her experience of living with uterine tumours throughout her 20s. It's an amazing collection. Um, but this poem, T, ends with these three lines. I do the small thing I know how to do to care for myself. I am trying to notice joy, which means survive. I do this all day and then the next. And I kept coming back and back to these lines. It felt to me like a kind of manifesto for living with a complex body mind. We can get so stuck focusing on things that we can't do. What about the one small thing we can do to care for ourselves? Can we celebrate that instead? So in the little interview in Missouri Review, Chatty explains that tea was written when she was in a depressive episode. She explains, there was one act of self-care, however, that I could bring myself to do with regularity, make tea. All day, each day, I did it. It's true. I made the connection one day between my love of dependency on even tea and the cultural role and history of tea in my Tunisian ancestry. Tea is so beloved in Tunisia that when it was under French rule, colonial administrators believed Tunisians' tea consumption was a psychological condition, teaism, similar to alcoholism, and that the amount of tea my people drank had poisoned both their bodies and minds. I was interested in examining my own experience with my body and mind, harm and care, pleasure and survival as it relates to tea. And this poem tumbled out of that. So for our next writing exercise, we're going to think about small acts of self-care and how they can connect us to other things. So this small act of self-care that she describes, making tea, connects her to a wider world and bigger ideas. Is the one small thing that you know how to do to care for yourself? And does it link you, like Chatty's Tea does, to history, community, ecology? So what, what do you do when you want to look after yourself? And again, don't think about this too hard. Just write down what comes to your mind. What's something you do 
that you feel it doesn't have to be something other people understand as an act of self-care at all but something that you do that you know makes you feel better and feels like something that's manageable that you do to look after yourself I've now got jackdaws going off on one side of me in the back garden and blackbirds going off in the front. And all I can hear are these birds. <laughs> it's like they knew what we were doing right now. How long have we got for this, Polly? Just a couple of minutes again. So don't think about it too hard. Just write what comes into your head. Okay, now we're going to expand on that. Um, when I've been struggling um, over these last few years, as I say, <clears throat> I keep coming back to these lines from T and this idea of trying to notice joy as a practice. It feels to me like a deliberate act towards joy. It doesn't mean it's easy or that you do notice it, but that the trying is important. And the trying is what makes it an act of survival. Um, Kaya Brown has an amazing essay in the collection Disability Visibility, edited by Alice Wong, in which she talks about the importance of joy to her as a black woman with cerebral palsy. It's called Nurturing Black Disabled Joy. Kia writes, we live in a society that assumes joy is impossible for disabled people associating disability only with sadness and shame. So my joy is revolutionary in a body like mine. She also writes about joy as something to work towards. I may not find joy every day. Some days will just be hard and I will simply exist. And that's okay too. The absence of joy isn't permanent. It's just the way life works sometimes. The reality of disability and joy means accepting that not every day is good, but every day has openings for small pockets of joy. And I really love that idea of openings for small pockets of joy. And for me, the natural world is a way that kind of enables me to, to find these openings for small pockets of joy. And for a lot of us, these small pockets of joy come from things outside ourselves. And the non-human world particularly, I think, can be a great source of small joys, whether that's watching cat videos on YouTube, watching birds in your garden or outside your window, or spending time with a pet. Some of you may have come across Emma Mitchell in her book, The Wild Remedy, 
Um, Emma writes really interestingly about even how looking at pictures of plants can enhance our mood. Um, and she makes really beautiful color wheels of plants that she's gathered, um, which then she goes back to afterwards as a way to help her mental health. Artist and writer Letty McHugh, who lives in the MS, who lives, who lives in the MS, lives with MS. Um, she lives in Haworth, that's <laughs> a different place. Um, uh, writes in her new book, Book of Hours, about gathering this sense of solace from the natural world to keep her going through bad days. Um, and I really love the way she talks about this. So I'm just gonna copy this bit of writing for you because it's a slightly longer bit into the chat, hopefully. For some reason I won't copy it, okay. Um, so let me just screen share this instead because it's slightly longer. Okay. So Letty writes, in September 2020, I went for a walk and noticed a perfect red rose growing in a neglected corner of a field near my home. I was very taken with the rose the day I saw it. It felt like a blessing, a secret gift tucked away in plain sight. In the next few weeks, I started noticing more and more unexpected flowers. Another rose, pink this time, deep inside the hedge of the war memorial, a clump of mystery wildflowers growing in a gateway, some delicate tiny white flowers pushing up through a crack in a pavement. Once I started looking for them, wildflowers were everywhere. I started to photograph flowers whenever I saw them, and saved them in a folder on my phone called Joy in Unexpected Places. Daisies pushing through cracks in pavements, roses in hedges, some unknown pretty pink things springing up at the edge of a gate. Even in the most inclement of conditions, joy finds a way of pushing through. So you can see there that she's looking at these tiny things um, and finding unexpected joy in them. And in a poem in the same book, um, she, which is called Count It All Joy, she writes, I'm saving up tiny joys the way a bear fattens up for the coming winter, um, which I just love. Um, so saving up tiny joys the way a bear fattens up for the coming winter. So this reminded me in turn of um, Ada Lemon's poem, Give Me This, in her new collection, The Hurting Kind. Um, and uh, again, you can find this online, but I'll just screen share it so we can have a look at it together. Okay, give me this. I thought it was the neighbor's cat back to clean the clock of the fledgling robins low in the nest stuck in the dense hedge by the house. But what came was much stranger, a liquidity moving all muscle and bristle, a groundhog slippery and waddle thieving my tomatoes still green in the morning shade. I watched her munch and stand on her haunches, taking such pleasure in the watery bites. Why am I not allowed delight? A stranger writes to request my thoughts on suffering. Barbed wire pulled out of the mouth, as if demanding that I kneel to the trap of coiled spikes used in warfare and fencing. Instead, I watch the groundhog closer and a sound escapes me a small spasm of joy I did not imagine when I woke. She is a funny creature and earnest, and she is doing what she can to survive. So this is gonna be a longer exercise. I'm gonna give you 15 minutes to think about this next one. Um, and you can take a bit of a break um, during this as well, wander off, do what you need to do. Um, and I'm gonna leave this up on the screen 
for you to look at. So what I'd like you to do is think of a time something non-human has given you a spasm of joy. And when you've used something from the natural world to help you to notice joy. This doesn't have to be in person. It could be listening to whale sounds or rain falling or watching the sea, or like Limon, watching an animal just being itself. In Limon's poem, the groundhog kind of stands in for her too, a funny creature and earnest doing what she can to survive. So I'm quite interested if the joy she feels is a kind of recognition. Like McHugh's wildflowers, the groundhog is persisting despite restriction. So what I'd like you to do is think of a thing that's given you joy, and it can be plant, animal, mineral, other, whatever. Um, describe the thing and also describe how it made you feel. How were you feeling before you experienced it? How does remembering it make you feel now? And what tiny joys would you store up for bleak times? So if you're going to store a load of joys up, what would they include? Uh, and we'll come back at the hour to see where you get to with that. Sorry, what's the name of the poem again? Sorry, it's um, Give Me This. Thank you. And I'll, I'll pop another link to it in the chat as well so you can see it.
Okay, if we try to just slowly come back to the present moment now. Do feel free to share what you've written in the chat if you feel comfortable doing that. Um, Stephen's put this amazing piece of writing um, about a Wren family in here, which is just so lovely. It's given me like a little spasm of joy to read that. Um, and that's what we're going to be thinking about next. So this idea of passing on joy. So one of the things I'm really interested in is how writing can be a mode of capturing and passing on these moments of kind of bottling them um, like jam for another season. <laughs> um, so how can we do that? And that idea of storing up joy um, for future times, um, how does that work? So I'm just gonna stop the share for a second as we go through. Um, so uh, Stephen also mentioned um, that there's a project that Rachel Lewis and Elspeth Wilson ran around disabled joy called Writing Happiness. Um, and there's a link in the chat there to the anthology um, that Stephen is in. And I think there's gonna be more workshops to do with that coming forward as well, um, which again is a really nice thing to be doing. Um, so thinking about kind of capturing moments of joy and what happens when we're storing them up, um, we're coming to the um, second major thing we're going to look at, um, which is this idea of gardens of the body mind. Um, so some of you may have done an exercise like this with me before, um, but to me, this is one of these things that you can keep redoing in different modes and different moods and see what happens. Um, but if you think, oh, I've already done this, um, then uh, you can go back and think about your joys a bit more, because again, I think we can keep piling them on um, on different days. Um, but we're going to try and build some virtual gardens. So not just thinking about um, one joy that could be stored away, but think what happens if we fill a, an imaginary space with joys um, is our next plan. Um, so in 2021, um, as Louise said, I published a book about Dorothy Wordsworth um, and her illness later in her life when she often couldn't leave her room. She loved plants, animals and birds and was happiest when she could spend time in the garden in her wheelchair. But when she couldn't be outside, she found ways to bring the garden into her room. And often this was literally in plant pots and in a pair of robins that nested above her bed, um, which I'm not necessarily recommending for everybody, could be a bit messy, um, but also in her imagination and in writing. So the details of the plants and flowers she can access from her room become really, really important to her when she can't go outside. And one bit I really love where she writes in her journal um, is about a sycamore tree she can see from her bed. She says, there's a round headed besom left on the sycamore and a forlorn, almost horizontal branch, neither of which, when I lie on my bed, I would part for for 20, 20 pounds. And that was in June 1834. So she was lying on her bed, looking at this particular bit of tree and thinking, um, I wouldn't part with that if somebody offered me 20 quid, which at the time, um, I don't know what the exchange rate is, but let's say it's 200 or 1,000. Anyway, a lot of money, big, big deal of money. Don't, don't chop down that sycamore tree. Um, and these things become really important to us, don't they? The things that we can access when we can't access other stuff. And I'm sure this feeling will be familiar to a lot of you. Um, and it may also bring to mind other contemporary disabled writers and artists who have similar experiences. Um, so as well in the chat, I mentioned Josie George, who talks about bimbling as a way to approach nature with energy living illness, energy limiting illness, which I really like. Um, and uh, 
artist, graphic novelist and writer Paula Knight, who takes photos from her bed and shares them on Instagram. And Louise introduced me to Elizabeth Turver Bailey's Sound of a Wild Snail Eating, which unpacks the author's relationship with a snail that lives in her room with her through illness when she can't leave her room. And again, it's really beautiful um, about the encounters that we can have when we can't go out there. And all of this really reminded me and was brought to mind for me as well by looking back at Dorothy Wordsworth. So she wrote a series of poems which she called Sickbed Consolations, the most famous of which is Thoughts on My Sickbed, which she wrote in spring 1832 when she couldn't get out into the garden. It tries to reconcile her feelings of missing the outdoors with this experience of bringing the plants into the room. So in the poem, she tells us she doesn't need to travel in her body because she can do it in her thoughts instead. It begins with bringing flowers into her room, but ends with the garden of the house she lives in, and then the local hills, and then the River Wye many miles away, all being kind of folded into her room. And writing the poem then becomes a way to preserve that feeling of joy that the flowers give her, a bit like taking a photo or pressing flowers might do. Um, so I'm just gonna share this poem so that you can see it. Uh, and then we're gonna do an exercise to try and build our own gardens of the mind. Here we go. So it's a bit of a long poem um, and it is in very early 19th century language. Um, and I also think it's interesting that it starts with an and. So she's starting in the middle of a thought, which I always love in a poem. And has the remnant of my life been pilfered of this sunny spring? And have its own prelusive sounds touched in my heart no echoing string? Ah, say not so. The hidden life couchant within this feeble frame hath been enriched by kindred gifts that undesired, unsought for came. With joyful heart in youthful days, when fresh each season in its round, I welcomed the earlier celandine glittering upon the mossy ground. With busy eyes, I pierced the lane in quest of known and unknown things. The primrose, a lamp on its fortress rock, the silent butterfly spreading its wings. The violet betrayed by its noiseless breath, the daffodil dancing in the breeze, the caroling thrush on his naked perch, towering above the budding trees. Our cottage hearth no longer our home, companions of nature were we. The stirring, the still, the loquacious, the mute, to all we gave our sympathy. Yet never in those careless days when springtime in rock, field or bower was but a fountain of earthly hope, a promise of fruits and the splendid flower, no, then I never felt a bliss that might with that compare, which piercing to my couch of rest came on the vernal air. When loving friends an offering bought, the first flowers of the year, culled from the precincts of our home, from nooks to memory dear. With some sad thoughts, the work was done, unprompted and unbidden, but joy it brought to my hidden life, to consciousness, no longer hidden. I felt a power unfelt before, controlling weakness, languor, pain. It bore me to the terrace walk, I trod the hills again. No prisoner in this lonely room, I saw green banks of why, recalling thy prophetic words, bard, brother, friend from infancy. No need of motion or of strength, or even the breathing air. I thought of nature's loveliest scenes, and with memory, I was there. So what I want you to do is build your own garden of the body-mind. If you had an ideal space that you could bring anything into, or if the room that you're stuck in you could bring anything into to make it a more joyful space, what would you bring into it? So all those things that might give you a small spasm of joy that we've thought about already, what would you put into? 
Um, and it can be as excessive um, or as imaginative as you like. It doesn't have to follow any of the laws of gravity, um, any of the laws of physics at all. You can put anything in there. It could be um, an underwater garden. Um, it could be a garden in space. Um, literally anything you feel like putting in there. Um, so long as it sparks joy, basically, bring it in. <laughs> um, so put everything in it that makes you feel happy or brings you comfort or solace or peace as you go and see what you can put in there, see what you can build into that space. Um, and you might find that you want to start with that space that you feel most confined or the space that you spend most time in and then start to populate it um, with other things, just like Dorothy did when she's bringing her plant pots in. So what would you bring in? What do you miss? Um, anything that you can imagine being in there, um, bring it in. And this is gonna become your kind of virtual garden, your garden of, of comfort and joy. So again, um, we'll say 10 minutes for this and then we can have a bit of a chat about it afterwards. Um, so uh, till 20 past, and then we can have a little bit of a chat before we finish.
Okay. Does anybody want to share anything about how they found putting together that garden or to share um, a little bit um, of their garden? Um, you can kind of wave or put, put your hand up or share something in the chat if you want to. I don't mind sharing. Yeah, go on. Okay. Um, is it okay to read my poem out? Yeah, go on, do it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Remember, this is the first draft, though. So, an angel's wing, the king of kings, the garden in my room. I'd bring some joys of buttercup, smells of summertime, of bright red roses in full bloom, summertime in my room. I'd bring honeysuckle, the sandy shore, all the things that I adore, daffodils, bluebells that bring back days of childhood and youth. But if you please, I'd bring the breeze to cleanse the humid air. When I'm crying and in pain, I dance in the summer rain, the warm rain of summer days and the smells of tarmac when the rain falls on freshly cut grass. That's so beautiful. Thank you. I love the repetition in there as well. But all of those things that you bring in, the smells and all of the kind of sensory aspects of the flowers, but also the sand and the rain is, is just really lovely. Um, what a room to be in. What a pleasure. Mm -hmm. That's really lovely. One of the things I miss, like being with the constant illnesses, the summer, I miss mm -hmm. the summer. And then you get the winter and it's cold and it's like, you know, you've missed the summer again. And yeah. It's so easy for kind of time to slip by like that as well, isn't it? Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. And Char Charlotte's put in the chat, um, I'd bring roses in and not fussy hybrids, but open dog roses, tea roses, honeysuckle again, honeysuckle and lilac. Um, the bees and hoverflies would feed upon them and I'd have my favourite sounds, scents and sights. And to lay on the bed with me would be my little JR, who's no longer here. I'd curl up with him under a floral cavern, touching his soft fur and hear his breathing and smell his ears. The smell of palmer violet sweets. Oh, what joy. That's just really lovely again, isn't it? Um, I love that. Um, and Emma, who... Um, Emma pointed out um, she makes literal jam jars of, of moments of joy, um, which is really lovely. Um, and that uh, reminded someone of uh, Tanya Shadrick, um, the writer who makes little tins, collection tins. I think it was Annick who mentioned it. Um, when she does go somewhere, um, she makes a little kind of memory box um, when she goes so that again she can return to that later on which I think is another really beautiful practice. Um, Angela did you want to read your bit? Yes please. Um, on. In my garden I will have visitors. Mousy will be there and bring her family all posing with a strawberry planter standing on their back legs reaching up with those impossibly little filigree razor sharp paws and claws to hold still the berry that sink, to sink their nagatia front teeth into, into the red and white flesh, briefly closing their eyes, then flopping them back open, flipping them back open to check for danger. In my veranda, all wrapped up on the rocking chair, the swing seat, a red kite will appear in my wood-framed window of the sky, displaying its feathers, the telltale fork tail, circling high above, so seemingly slowly from here below. A horse will wander in, treading lightly on the boards, neighing softly and blowing its sweet hay breath into my face on the days when pain and fatigue confine me. A flock of geese will fly over, honking with that wistful sound of the high Arctic. My dog will wander over to the flower bed atop the dry stone wall, pick a calendula flower, carefully sideways down the stem and with the sun orange flower head sticking out of the side of his gob will come to me and drop the gorgeous creature in my lap then he will sit pretty hoping for his usual share this feudal overload of us all uh, 
I love that. Another amazing one. I was so there with you in that space. And again, what amazing things to bring in the honking, honking of the geese with the, the feeling of the Arctic, but also the, the hot hay breath of the horse. Um, somehow just it kind of gave me shivers thinking about that. Um, really lovely. And that calendula flower, um, absolutely beautiful and, and so tender again, just really lovely. I have to say, minus the horse, all those things actually are here. So, oh, yeah. well, what, what an absolute bonus. The veranda is yet to be built with my swing seat, but we'll get there. <laughs> I, I have I have dreams of of these things like a, a room that has light that comes into it uh, <laughs> for instance you know the things we can but dream for one day I always had this idea that uh, one day I'd have a room where I would paint silver birches into the corners um, of the room so that it was like I was in a forest all the time um, but renting you don't get much chance to um or in the UK, certainly renting in the UK, landlords tend to frown on things like turning your room into a forest. So <laughs> you have to do it in your poems instead. <laughs> um, there's some really lovely bits in the chat as well. So beautiful. Um, I love this uh, idea uh, VT says of walking my cat at night, um, which is really wonderful. So lovely. Um, and uh, Rosa bringing the window bigger and open wider um, and the walls with ivy trailing leaves on the walls. So beautiful. All of these are really fantastic. Um, just really, really wonderful. And as I said before, this is, um, I think a lot of my favorite writing exercises are actually exercises that you can play and replay whenever you need them um which uh i don't know maybe that's a sign of my <laughs> my slightly obsessive thinking um but if i like something i do like to do it a lot um and i think this is one of these things that you can kind of play with yourself a game you can play with yourself when you are in in that dark place in in confinement um and bring those things in with you um, and it'd be quite interesting to see how that changes over time, maybe what you think that you're reaching out for or what you're missing, um, what you want to bring into that space um, and what kind of relationships you're wanting to have with those things as well as you go along. Um, we've just got a couple of minutes left, so maybe we should call it a day there. Um, I'm going to send round the full script with everything that I've said in for you so that you have everything there and, and all of the book titles and all of the bits of writing. Um, and this has been recorded, so it will go up um, on the Moving Mountains website. Are we going to put it up, up there, Louise? So um, if you want to rewatch and go back through, you can do that as well. Um, and thank you all for being here today. This has just been really wonderful. Um, and everything you've written has been so fantastic. Um, so I hope that you can go away and spend some time opening those little pockets to put some joys in um, and notice them along the way as you go. Um, thank you all. Oh, that's been so wonderful, Polly. Um, it just feels like a beautiful end of week, soothing, calm for us to take us into the weekend. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to everyone for coming and sharing so much of your beautiful writing as well. That's, that's been a real treat to read. Um, and lovely gifts of things that we can take away with us to, to continue to store our pockets of joy um, and I hope the beginnings of things and ideas of for writing to to continue um, the so the recording will be I've I'll put the um, website up if you don't know already um, sorry I'm not very good at doing more than one thing at a time <laughs> 
any of us. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm putting links to all that. It's a very simple website, but just with pointers. Um, and I think um, the Hypermobility Syndromes Association are going to host that. So I will put links up to everything. Um, and as soon as we can get the recording up, um, HMSA will host that for us with links both ways, I'm sure. Um, so yes, thank you also to Lisa for coming and telling us a bit more about what you do at HMSA um, and for links to this session and future ones you can find more at that Moving Mountains Anthology um, website. So our next workshop is with Resting Up Collective in August um, and we're yet to get a booking link but that will be on the website and I shall advertise that again also. Um, Yes, yeah, so I hope you can join us then. Thank you very much for coming. Have a restful weekend um, and look forward to seeing you at another event really soon. Have Thank a lovely weekend. You. Thank you so much. It was really inspiring. Thank you. Thank that you. was brilliant. Oh, thank really you. Really amazing. Thank you. I'll just keep everything open for a few minutes. So um, as you filter out, if you need to see anything, you can see it. And I will email round to everybody the full sheet. Okay, I'm going to close us down. I'm going to stop us recording. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Polly.